uh, this is a film to show where I'm up to on the, the 3D printed Enigma machine and also sh show some of the problems I have, um, issues I need to solve caused by trying to make something out of plastic that's normally made out of metal. Um, I've made some progress on it. What I've got here is the three rotors um, set inside the, the piece of the mechanism that holds them all together. And uh, what I'm trying to do is make sure that the machine works mechanically before I, I go ahead and start wiring it up electrically. So these don't have any contacts or anything in them at the moment, they're just purely physical. Um, what we actually have is the, the rotor stack, which is this in the middle, um, the entry wheel here, and the reflector on the end here. So what happens in operation is when you press a key, it sends an electrical signal through the rotor stack. Um, when I was building the bomb, I called this a scrambler. Uh, to, to, to break it into and put it in as, as, as a single unit, you, you call it a scrambler. So what it does is you feed a signal in here and it goes through the rotors onto the reflector, which does exactly what it says. It reflects the signal back in. And then it goes back through the rotors and back out the entry wheel. Um, so electrically, it's fairly straightforward. I want to make sure that it'll work mechanically first. So that's why I've mocked all this up. Um, at the moment, it's on a wooden base because eventually I'm going to 3D print the base, but it's going to be such a huge print, it'll probably take three or four days. I want to make sure I've got it absolutely right before I commit to, to such a large print. Um, this, this piece here is the, the biggest print I've done so far for this machine. Um, and this is the piece that the uh, keys press on. At the back here are the poles, and they, they engage with the the ratchets on the rotors and that's what makes them go round. So this works like a, a seesaw basically, it's pivoted in the middle here and as you press down on this end, the keys when they press down cause the, the poles to lift up and down and that's what drives the rotors round. And so this is a good example of where I couldn't just make it out of 3D printed material because it's not accurate enough and it's not strong enough. So. For example, the axle through the middle here, what I've done is embedded a brass tube all the way through the middle. Um, so there's a slot inside this piece and then these little covers which hold it in place. And that gives me a nice axle which you couldn't really easily do just out of plastic. So this piece here, uh, the rotors here, the reflector is on a sort of, a, a sort of ramp system, uh, almost like a cam. So there's a little lever here that when you bring it back it lets the reflector move across and then the rotor stack pulls out of the machine like that. Um, these pieces here, these little levers in the back with rollers on them, now they're what um, physically locks the rotors into each position. That's, that's what causes the rotors to, to have fixed positions as it moves around. And these little rollers actually run on the little scallops of the, um, what I call the thumb wheels on each rotor here. So if we, if we put this back in, um, actually it's worth showing the, this is the reflector that just comes on and off. This is another example of where I've used metal because I couldn't accurately 3D print a long spindly piece like that and have any strength in it. Um, it would just break. So, so that's a little piece of brass tube that runs in this little slot and that's what stops the reflector from rotating around but it's a bit tricky to see inside the middle of the reflector there I've actually got an embedded brass tube the same as I do on the um, on the rotors so that the the axle that they run on it runs very smoothly um, you can see on the back of the reflector there are these sort of ramps and this is how everything's clamped together in the machine so when, when the rotors are completely finished, there will be um, flat contacts on this side and springy contacts on this side. So you can imagine the little springy contacts want to push everything apart. And so the um, reflector here is on the sort of cam system. Whoops, everything's collapsed. Um, so that when this is in place on this little shaft, as you move the lever backwards and forwards, it moves the reflector in and out um, and that's what lets you replace the rotor stack 
and swap the rotors around. So if we put that back in, it'll be a little bit tricky. That's how it all clamped together. If we turn this round, you can see on the back here how these little arms rotate and there's a little roller on them. Normally there'll be springs in the bottom here pushing the arms against the, the rotors. Um, I haven't got the springs in place yet, but we can sort of simulate how that works if I just push on these. And you can see how rotating these will lock each one in place as it follows around the, the scallops and the outside. So this is where I've come across a little bit of a problem, which is this mechanism here, these two bars are joined either end and they're part, um, the bars are actually sprung, they're, they're on a spring to make that whole thing spring backwards and forwards and that's running along the edge of this lever here. And so what happens is when you go to change the, the rotors and you bring that forwards, it actually pushes this little bar out to disengage these off the rotors. So, so they, they, they rotate freely. And this is the problem I have. You can see that one is hitting the rotor and it's because this bar here twists. You can sort of see it twisting there. And this is because these pieces are made out of plastic and they're nowhere near as accurate um, as if you'd made them out of steel. If this was steel, you could drill that hole perfectly so that there would be no twisting motion in that piece. But because it's plastic and it's not as strong, I get this twisting. Um, so what I end up having to do is remake some of the pieces to compensate for this. So what I did is this piece is exactly as it is in a real Enigma machine, but that's not going to work for me. So what I end up doing is remodeling the parts and I made them fatter. So this is twice the width. And because that's twice the width, I had to make this piece so that it's shorter across there. Um, same on the other side, I've made it twice the width. The idea being that if I've got more of the tube inside the plastic, hopefully that stops that racking motion. Um, it's a bit hard to, to see, but we back that off and pull this out. Without the springs in the base, these, these arms just flop all over the place, so it's a bit tricky. Um, but you can see how this piece will eventually fit inside there and move up and down to engage with the, the ratchet here. And that's what pushes the little the wheels around. Um, and because there's friction between the, the contacts that'll be in between the rotors, that's why you need these little little wheels to actually hold these in place so that only one moves at a time. So my next job is to replace these pieces with the with the fatter ones and see if that makes it more rigid. So whoops this is after I've made the modifications um, to this sort of locking mechanism on here and fitted these these deeper blocks and that has now eliminated the twist that was in that piece before so this now works a lot better um, I still haven't got the springs in the base there but you can see how that will allow the wheels to click around and then when the lever is pushed back these um, definitely clear Oh, it's a bit tricky to see. Like I say, without the springs there, it's a bit hard to hold everything in place. But um, now, because this, this piece isn't twisting, those will be held well away from the, the rotors for when you need to change them out. Um, it's kind of worth showing what we have here. This is the, this is the box of all my experimental bits and pieces. Um, you can see it's full off previous bits and pieces that I've printed. Um, for example, this piece goes in there normally. And on the, the real Enigma machines, I couldn't quite figure out what this piece was for. 
Um, but um, Paul, who is building a, a proper replica of an Enigma machine, um, sent me a little film that sort of explained it. Um, this piece normally goes across there to help hold all this together, but there are these little arms. And what they're for is when this is moving quickly, um, say someone's typing quickly, these, these could bounce and they could miss the, um, the ratchets inside there. So these little arms actually end up sitting somewhere like that so that, so that these can't fly too far backwards. Uh, apparently that's what that's for. You don't really need it. Um, this machine is not going to be operated quickly if it operates at all. So that's why I replaced this with a, um, a solid aluminium bar. And you can see that this printed, um, it just is never going to be as strong. It's, it's got flex in it and it's just not as rigid. So that's why in some places I just have to use metal, like, like for the shafts. Um, and for things like this, they have to be metal. Uh, another good example is the, um, the lever here. So this little lever kind of looks like that. That was a, a, a rough printed version. But um, I don't know if I've got somewhere in this box. Um, you can see, for example, this one here, the, the little end piece broke off. Um, because that's just too narrow. You can, you can see this. I can probably break that pretty easily. Well, that's fairly strong. Um, so I ended up having to strengthen all this, which is, which is why my lever now is quite, quite a bit thicker here. Uh, things like this rib had to be added to make this rigid enough so it wouldn't flex in that direction. Um, there's all sorts of little bits and pieces like that. So the whole machine has to be re-engineered effectively so that you can make it out of plastic rather than metal. Um, and that's basically what I'm doing at the moment. So my next step is to, um, on the wooden base, I am going to, if we pull these out, sort of gets, gets stuck on the levers at the back at the moment because there's no springs holding them, so they just fall down and jam everything. But if we take the, the rotors out, uh, the next step is to set up this, which is the, the keyboard mechanism, so it is sitting in the right place. It's going to be somewhere like that. Um, I need to figure out the exact measurements. Um, I've just noticed another potential problem, which is the, the ends of these are hitting the ends of my split pins uh, for this mechanism. So I'll just drop my rotors. Um, so I may need to look into that. Uh, it sort of depends on where exactly this goes. So what I'll do is from the blueprints, I'll figure out where this axle goes in relation to everything else and figure out what the position of this is. Um, I believe it'll be, it'll be somewhere like that. So it'll probably clear those okay. So that will be the, the next step. And um, there's my, my rotor stack. Um, so of course these these can be put on in any order and um, I can't remember if I've shown before how the the ring setting works so I've got the little plastic tab in there if you push that back you can then rotate the ring around to change the ring setting and then this should lock back into place like that so that's how the rings are adjusted. It fits back on there. And then this whole thing drops in. To the out. I, I think maybe the first thing I need to do is put the little springs in the bottom to keep these out of the way because they, they keep falling down. It's a real pain. So it goes like that. 